Welcome back to How to Be a Better DM, the official podcast of Monsters.Rent. I'm Justin Lewis. And I'm Tanner Wayland. And we are here to help you tell better stories for yourself and your players as you dungeon master sessions of D&D, Dungeons and Dragons. We'd like to give you some quick announcements. We actually have one before the show. And then after the show, if you want to stick around, we have some more announcements then as well. Uh, but first, let's talk about this. Tired of being alone? Are you tired of not having any of your players understand you? Are you tired of never truly belonging? Well, you're in luck. All you need to do is join the Guild. The Guild is a unique and exclusive experience that is only open to Dungeon Masters. It is a full community focused on helping ease your DMing burdens. Want to meet other DMs? Join the Guild. Want to discuss your homebrew ideas with people who would appreciate it instead of just telling your cat? Join the guild! Want to find a place where all your wildest dreams will come true? Join the guild! Go to monsters.rent slash guild and sign up today for free. Wait, that can't be right. Chark, Chark, can you check this again? Is this supposed to be... What? Oh, it's... They're serious? It's free? Oh. Okay, all right. Yes, go to monsters.rent slash guild and sign up today for free, even though they are crazy for giving this away for free. Common side effects may include burping, sneezing, laughing, breathing, hearing, listening, tasting, farting, critting, sarcasm, and in extreme cases, explosive diarrhea. Awesome. With that out of the way, we can get into today's show. All right, well, thank you for coming on the show, Garrett. Thanks for joining me and Tanner. Uh, let's jump in with some really interesting questions. Uh, first of all, as an experienced dungeon master, what is your favorite class and why? Uh, my favorite class, I think, would have to would have to be dungeon master. If that's a class, <laughs> if we can count that as a class, that would be my favorite. I much prefer to be behind the screen than in front of the screen. But uh, if I have to be a player, I think uh, usually cleric or bard is my go-to. Since I'm a I'm a real life musician, I kind of like to role play that because I think I can I can do it okay since I know. How musicians think, for sure. I like that. Oh, that's great. Do you ever actually like bring an instrument? Uh, I do. To use? We uh, we had a series on the 225 Instagram for a while, and I need to bring it back. But it was like how to introduce uh, instruments to the game table uh, in a tasteful way. So it would be like, oh, these are the instruments that you might want if your game is within this unique flavor and stuff. Because I was a music major in college, and like musicology was kind of my focus in there. It was like the study of instruments and the study of. Uh, cultural musics and whatnot so it'd be like oh if it's an irish flavor maybe you'd want maybe fiddles and bazookis and banjos and balrons and everything or if it's a middle eastern flavor maybe you'd want these instruments um so it's nice to be able to bring that to the table then it kind of livens things up as opposed to my player my my character really uh strums the lute so well uh, and i'm gonna roll to prove that to you <laughs> it's kind of it can be done in real time so uh, it adds a different kind of uh spin on things i like that and you know, the moment that they bring a bagpipe in, you know, it's over. <laughs> yeah, that's then we just... all run. It, the session's done. Yeah. Head <laughs> out. It's just, over. You know, no bagpipes or recordings allowed. Total party kill right there. The, they're, they're, it's, <laughs> it's, a nat, it's a natural one every time they play it. At basically. 100%. Accordions and bagpipes are, are my, uh, uh, I, I don't like them. Personally, that's just a personal taste. <laughs> that's my hot take. Okay, well, uh, that's a great answer. I, honestly, I love clerics and, and bards too. I feel like they, there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, okay, next kind of warm-up question for you. Uh, if you could have one skill or mechanic from D&D in real life, what would you have? I would try and dump as many things into perception as I could because I feel like me personally, um, in real life, I get so tunnel vision about things that I miss things that are around me or things that other people are doing like you've never noticed that no no i've never noticed that <laughs> but thank you for pointing that out um so if i could just dump all my stats into one thing definitely uh i would be expert in uh, perception all day every day it's like not even a contest no question about it i hear that you're just like going along and suddenly you just realize what's important in life and it's, you're like it's oh, a wait, lot less poetic that. than that <laughs> Um, usually it's like, yeah. oh, I never noticed the door opened this way and that way or something real right. silly like that, you know, or I never noticed this picture on the wall. 
But um, but then you feel real stupid when someone's like, "How have you never noticed that?" And he said, "I I don't know because yeah. I'm not perceptive, I guess." I think I would do insight because I feel like I'm the same way, but with people, you know, like, "Oh, you were unhappy with me about that? I didn't I didn't know, you know." But that's just me. That is true. A perce- insight's just perception with with people, right. so you right. know, two sides of the same coin. I exactly. think. Exactly. Um, kind of <laughs> tacking onto the first question we asked. You said, you know, your favorite class is the DM. Well, if you had to personify your dungeon master style with a character, like what what character would that be? What would be your dungeon master avatar? Like a like a fantasy character or a uh, like a fictional character? Well, so if you had to essentially create a character like your players do, but that character had to represent uh, your dungeon master style. What kind of character would that be? Oh, that's an interesting question. I like that question. Um, I think my, there's a player at my table. Uh, he's the second half of 225, actually. His name's Chris. And he plays in my campaign, this uh, Tenarian world, which is just whimsical as ever. Um, he plays a halfling rogue named Trouble. And he's he plays him kind of like how one would play a bard, but he's a rogue. So he's just very whimsical and he's very, um, likes to, you know, give his party members a hard time. Uh, doesn't really like combat all that much, but loves to watch and kind of play cheerleader or, uh, trip the fighter on his way in to make a killing blow or something like that. Just to, just to keep the labs going. Um, that would be, that would be my, my avatar. Just somebody that's whimsical um, that just creates a fun story and doesn't take things too seriously because at the end of the day, we're playing make-believe with rules, and my humble belief is that if that's taken too seriously, it can lose fun really, really quickly. Yeah, absolutely. No one likes it when you're trying to have fun and someone turns it into a serious thing, like a, competi- like a not fun competition <laughs> where the goal is not fun, but it's winning, you know, exactly. <laughs> over everyone else. Yeah. Yeah, and if it uh, becomes a, a, a game of numbers and a game of stats and you know min maxing and things, um, it's great for some tables. It's great for some play groups. Um, that's not how I roll. I love to do the role play right. thing first. Numbers are just numerical, mathematical representatives of what's happening in the story. Right. Help things that make we can sense. think of as like players instead of our characters. Exactly. Um, but when it becomes too much about the numbers and not enough about embracing the characters and embracing uh, story structure and, and character development, then it loses that kind of storytelling focus. And at the end of the day, that's kind of why it exists, and that's what it's all about. I had a yeah, great. Uh, I had a sorry. yeah. Go ahead. I had a, a best friend who I've been trying to get to play with me for like years and years, and and he's like, honestly, man, like D and D just seems like a meeting, and and. Like when you know you're min maxing, it's it's basically you know a meeting. It, there's like no difference. But if you know you're focused yeah. on the story, it's different. Yeah, and I think I mean min maxing has its place, I guess. Um, but I I feel like if one is to min max, one should go play Skyrim <laughs> and not D and D. Because if you want to be an almighty powerful wizard, go do that. Um, go play an MMO. Go play WoW. Go play Guild Wars. Go play Skyrim. Uh, at the tabletop, the tabletop role playing game. We like to role play and. Uh, be people who are not on a daily basis and embrace those personality traits that we wish we could in real life. Yeah, a great way to put it. I mean, I think that most other mediums are more, like like board games even, are a more natural medium for just like sheer numbers, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, why do we role play? That's why they moved from war games back in the day to D&D, right? Uh, Yeah, great point. Uh, Okay, so... Last question here. Biggest DM mistake that you've ever made? And no judgment here. We've all made it. <laughs> I would say it's it's a kind of a reoccurring mistake for me. And my biggest weakness, and, and we talked about this last night, We uh, Chris and I did a DM coaching session, and I, I had to admit my faults and, and humble up a little bit. Um, but I, I'm so quick to admit my faults. I am not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just taking it one day at a time like everybody else. Um, but... I have a problem with remembering the things that I do. And for instance, like I have a I have a story structure, but I'll forget about the the bard NPC that I brought along, like Peter in the Tenarian campaign at the tabletop. Um, Peter's this bard that met 
my party and the, the Kindred Hearts party. Um, and then I kept forgetting about Peter, and they'd be like, what about Peter? And I'm like, oh, Peter's been writing songs this whole time in the corner. That's a good point you brought up there, uh, Chris. Thank you. Um, or we have a druid. My, my fiance is druid. Uh, she has a, a raccoon named Felix. That's her, like, her, um, her familiar, her, her pet. Um, and I always forget about Felix every session. I'm like, well, what's Felix doing? Oh, Felix is just vibing. He's just eating grapes <laughs> and just having himself a good old time. And I have to make something up on the fly because I always forget about those little details. I've got the big structure, and I'm always concerned about what the players are doing. And I forget to go in and be like, oh, yeah, that that NPC needs uh, – he's doing something for sure, I promise. Uh, it's not important right now. Let's go back to you. What are you up to? <laughs> that's okay. I mean, it, it, no one expects you to to be the fabric of reality, even though that's essentially what you are when, when playing D&D, you know? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's kind of, I guess, the DM's job, right? Uh, you are God, and you have to make this world come to life before your players' eyes, but also, you're also a human, uh, so you're not going to do it as well as a literal God could. So just go with the flow and have fun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As long as your players are having fun, you're doing something right. Uh, th thank you, Adventure, for joining us today on How to Be a Better DM. Uh, if you haven't noticed yet, uh, we're not alone. Uh, we are joined by Garrett. He is one half of 225 Games, uh, and you can actually find them. We'll put their link in the show notes. Um, but uh, the first question I actually wanted to ask Garrett, just because I'm, I'm a naturally curious person, where does the name 225 Games come from? That's a great question, and one that we uh, we get a lot. Uh, it has nothing to do with Chris, actually, ironically. I started 225, and I was like, Chris, I love your brain. Please join me. And he said, Absolutely. <laughs> I was waiting for you to ask. So it was a match made in heaven. I love Chris. He's he's awesome guy. But uh, 225 was my college apartment um, when I was in college. And all of my really good friends, uh, we were all roommates together. And it was a party every day. Not like, not, not like Red Solo Cup college party, but like we would be playing Destiny. And we'd be playing Poker Night. And then we'd be smoking cigars on the balcony. And, and we'd just have a couple drinks every now and then. Uh, and we would just spend all day together. And... For me, like that meant the world growing up and not having that. Uh, I mean, in West Texas, not everybody's into D and D, but they sure do love to drink and shoot guns. So for me, who's like, that's not my vibe. Um, to finally have that community and finally have that uh, that tribe, um, it's a fun way to keep that legacy going and as a way to like say thank you to those guys out there. Um, all those those three guys, um, just kind of keep that alive and keep that name going in, in spirit. That's beautiful. Um, well, let's kind of dive into today's topic of dynamic storytelling. And uh, I guess I guess the general idea of today's show is, you know, what is a dynamic campaign and how do you create one? So, Garrett, first of all, tell us, what do you consider to be a dynamic campaign and what would be the opposite of that? I think to me, whenever you say dynamic, it means more lifelike realistic than static um and i think the difference between the two would be a static campaign um is a campaign that can take place in any world if you put it in the context of greek mythology or norse mythology or you threw it in middle earth or forgotten realms you put it on the planet of arrakis you put it on tatooine you can put it in any um any intellectual property any world any uh franchise that you want if it's still the same story and it doesn't matter where it takes place, your story is static and it, it, it isn't good enough. Uh, a dynamic campaign is where characters and the world come together in this perfect, um, in this synchronous way. Um, and there's a synergy there that you can't have one without the other, which is, I think, like Star Wars. You can't have Tatooine without Luke Skywalker and you can't have Luke Skywalker without Tatooine. Uh, you can't have Paul Atreides without Arrakis. You can't have King Arthur without Camelot. Uh, those would be dynamic stories. They're timeless. And when you can't, again, when you can't separate the two, that's when your campaign goes from static and eh to, oh my God, this is an amazing story. And I am so thankful to be at this table. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that uh, when I think of, I mean, I, there's actually a podcast I was list I've been listening to for years. Uh, and and they did a campaign and at the start and I see this a lot with campaigns where lower leveled players 
uh, or campaigns tend to have a good amount of variety because you can't focus all your time on these huge battles where everybody's got a billion different abilities and everything. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay, simpler battles, and then we got some role playing, and then we got some skill check. You know, they try and keep it very dynamic and different. Uh, but then later on in that same podcast, when they got into higher level play, uh, I noticed that it just became a lot of battles. And that because the battles took so long, you know, they the role playing in between just didn't feel nearly uh, like di differentiated enough, right? And so it felt a little static to me, at least. Yeah. Um, and I think part of that, and I don't, I don't want to get ahead of, you know, the, the rest of the structure of the podcast, but um, if there are battles and there is combat and there are fights, just because, like, you're like, oh, we haven't done combat in a while and I don't want my players to be bored, that's not a good enough reason to do combat. Your players have to wait. Or you have to invent combat that matters to service the plot and the characters. That way, anything and everything you do in your story matters which is why I'm not a fan of random encounter charts. I'm like, oh, we haven't done it. Well, let's roll for a random encounter. That's, that does nothing to serve. That just buys time. And if you're going to buy time, then do something else. Go to a tavern. Go invent an NPC on the fly that, that matters and can service the plot. Fighting goblins in the forest, because you haven't fought goblins in the forest for three sessions, is not a good enough time. And that's how you're going to get static and burnt out really quickly, both the DM and the players. So kind of a, an interjection question. Um, I think that is a very interesting viewpoint. <clears throat> so a lot of people, myself included, uh, I use random encounter tables specifically for travel because I have no idea how to make travel interesting uh, without making it realistic and, and so forth. So, so how do you treat travel um, long distances, short distances, kind of the whole gamut? That depends on the story. I wouldn't... I, for my own sake, I never let travel be travel. If they are traveling and now they see something on the road, whatever they see on the road or whatever combat they have needs to service the plot um, in some sort of way. Whether it's it's bandits on the road, oh, well, maybe these bandits are just these underlings to a bigger problem somewhere else. And maybe they have a letter on them that they drop that maybe is in thieves' cans, and now the rogue has a purpose. And now the rogue feels like, oh, he's paying attention to me and he's paying attention to those little details. Like, I can read Thieves' Camp, right? So, but if it's, congratulations, you killed all the bandits. Okay, now what? Now we just keep going to the town? It was just an obstacle. It's like, it's running track and there's hurdles and you just have to jump over the hurdles. Okay, well, the hurdles are just there for you to jump over. They serve no real purpose other than that. How high can you jump? Um, so again, I would say, like, for people who love combat and kind of that more min-max, and I know that term gets like a real bad negative rap but if you happen to have a real min maxi table combat heavy wargaming kind of kit table maybe that's great uh in my experience and in, in what i do i plot in character development over combat every day all day long um so if there is combat it always has to service the plot so if they're going from one town to the others three days pass you are now in the town great three days have passed um or on your way there a demon uh, you, you hear the rumblings of a demon in the forest. And, and uh, Chris and I are working on this Gilgamesh campaign that I keep harking on and harking on and harking on. Um, but it's still in the works. Um, but so in Tenaria, they went through the cedar forest where uh, Jardith lived. But Jardith is just keyword for uh, Humbaba, who is from the Epic of Gilgamesh, who were trying to turn that into a, to a campaign. So for, a, for plot reason that's a big plot element now there's a king demon in the forest and there's these little you know demon underlings with him okay now that's that's a plot element rather than you have these demons in the forest why i don't know or goblins in the forest why i don't know okay let's move on one thing i do like about your answer garrett is like you know you can like you travel can be a mechanic that's interesting in a game if it serves a purpose mm -hmm. and that's kind of what i'm coming i'm seeing a lot in this discussion is that dynamic, at least for a DM, is, yeah, it's about variety, but it's not variety for variety's sake. Exactly. It's variety for, for story's sake. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, if it's like, oh, your characters are usually in typical grassy plains, you know, normal uh, temperate forests, but instead they're up in a frozen mountain and they're hiking that, 
then all of a sudden a bunch doing a bunch of uh, checks to make sure that they're okay and that they're not getting frostbite or anything else that's interesting because one's varied and two yeah. it's like oh they're actually it's showing in a mechanical way that they're doing something hard right and, and not just for hard sake it's you know it's changing it up right yeah and that even um, at and I, i'm sorry yeah. i didn't mean to cut you off the the, the no, lag kind of got in the way but um it kind of reminds me of the Binds of Moria and like going up the mountain in the snow. There's tension there. There's plot tension. Why? Because they're in the snow and they're in cloaks and these hobbits have bare feet. You're like, are they, are their toes about to fall off from the frostbite? Like what's about to happen? Why are they doing this? This seems really risky. And that adds that risk in there. Um, so again, it services the plot. It adds tension, especially if you have them roll those survival checks and whatnot. It's like, oh, did it. ooh, yikes! Yeah, your your foot got a little uh, chilly there as you climbed this mountain, and uh, oh well, they got to go to the uh, the long term injury section of the DMG and and figure out how to how to assess this or whatever, right? Yeah, and and that kind of makes me think of, you know, how do you? The next question I would ask you is, how do you create a dynamic world? Right, because it, obviously most campaigns, they take place in a pretty typical fantasy setting. You're gonna have typical towns, typical, you know, castles. <laughs> uh, you're not gonna have too much uh, a variety there, and people are gonna rely more on the NPCs and, and maybe the combats to add variety. But in terms of a dynamic world, how, how do you think you can make that? That's an interesting question, and I want to prompt that question with this question i want you to answer this question for me yeah. and that can help i think that's going to answer your question what's the difference between are you familiar with dune and star wars by chance yes okay so what would be the difference between arrakis and tatooine both are desert planets oh, but what's the difference that's actually really good that's a good point honestly they they're very similar uh in terms of actual um climate i guess you could say uh, the difference is uh, what what kind of the players are making of them, right? Because Arrakis, it's like, oh, this place, you got the spice that everybody's going crazy for. It's got a lot of political intrigue. Whereas Tatooine, it's filled with a bunch of people who aren't interested in it at all. <laughs> and they're just trying to get out, and it's more, you know, cutthroat. Um, yeah, that's actually a great point, that you could take any kind of environment, and depending on the objects the goals and the characters you put in it it almost becomes an entirely different place yeah i think you just huh. answered that question all on your own where it you, if you're again if your story can fit in any world your story's not good enough but at the same time if your world feels like a world like I, if it just feels so plain and bland and it feels like forgotten realms it feels like dragon lands or whatever and i'm not trying to bash wizards worlds or anything but um mm -hmm. if it feels just like you reskinned all the gods in all of the places to new names, but it feels the same, then that's not dynamic enough. That's a static world. And you might as well just play in Forgotten Realms because the source books are already there. <laughs> um, for instance, um, in the 225 game world, uh, Story Elus, which we've been world building on World Building Wednesdays on our Twitch channel for a couple weeks now, Chris and I, um, and we'll have some guests on there every now and then too. Um, it's what I call uh, Shrek meets Peaky Blinders. So it's very whimsical and very, you know, all these very fairy tale kind of stuff. You have the big bad wolves and you have these pixies and you have this and that and the other, except there's a God and there's this whole backstory about um, there's one God and he has three sisters, the triumvirate, and they overthrow the God because the God sucks. Um, and they try to be so good that they aren't, it's kind of like a mom who gives their kids everything they want and they have no discipline. So the mom kind of sucks. That's kind of the vibe that this is going for. And now the world's kind of in this misshapen place where um, the the Pixinelli are these pixie empire and they're kind of like the the Italian mob. <laughs> and then you have the, uh, the, uh, the Wolfavian empire and they're like the Irish mob. So you've got these two mob families um, at battle with each other because the Jarl, who is um, a, kind of a thinly veiled uh, church structure, very, you know, very holy, very um, hierarchical, uh, they they banned wild magic and they banned a substance called moonshine magic or moonshine mana excuse me so with this moonshine mana anybody can drink it and they take a roll on the wild uh, they take a take a walk on the wild side as we say in the game uh, <laughs> where they roll on the wild chart the the wild magic chart and whatever happens happens um, 
but now it's like the Pixinelli work with the Yaro, but they've got the mob family kind of doing the black market stuff, but they also have to work with the Wolfavian because they have Wolfsbane, and Wolfsbane plus the Pixie Dust is what makes the Moonshine mana. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend, so even though they don't get along, they have to get along, and now our players are put into this uh, political climate. So all of that to say, not this is an advertisement for Story Elders, but all of that to say, um, if you want your world to be dynamic and you want it to have a unique flavor, you have to start with a theme. And I think the theme of Story Elders is political intrigue and um, really it's just political intrigue, political intrigue and, and religious, uh, religious rivalry, because there's people that love the old god. There's people that love the Triumvirate, and there's people that love the Yarrow, who is the new god on, on Story Elders, God Incarnate. Um, so which one's the real god? And now it's everybody's got their own theological beliefs and differences. Plus, in the midst of that, now there's all this, who's got control of the Wolfsbane? Who's got control of the, the Pixie Dust? And how are the Pixnelli working with the Yarrow? But also trying to stab him in the back, and also trying to, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, very godfather, very uh, good fellows, the Irishman kind of vibes. Um, which is not something you see in every world, which is what makes that dynamic. But if I went into Forgotten Realms and I just renamed everything and I was like, this is my world. Well, that's not, that's not nothing. You got to make it something new. Start with a theme, take elements from other existing things and combine it. And even if you watch um, people bigger than me, and I'm not big, I'm just saying people way bigger than me, like Barrington Sanderson and his talks that he does at BYU, um, he just combines things. He's, he's this combiner. He takes this and this and makes this. He takes like uh, the heist stuff and what, the mist and he makes Mistborn and boom, there's Mistborn. So that's, and that's coming from him. So do what he says. I'm just repeating what he's saying. Just combine stuff and to start with a theme. If you want your theme to be whatever, well, start with that theme and then how is that gonna play into your world? I couldn't agree more. That seemed really long winded, but I hope that I hit the, I hope you got what I was trying to say. Nailed it. For sure, for sure. Sweet. Okay, then I did my job. Ta -da. So uh, if, if I can kind of summarize it, it sounds like one of the key aspects of making a campaign dynamic is not only making excellent characters, but also making the setting a character, in, and, and even the story to a degree, kind of a character, and having those three character groups interact and affect each other and change each other, right? Absolutely, it's this holy trinity of storytelling. Like you have your setting, you have your uh, you have your characters, um, and you have your players. If one of those is out of whack, the story's going to fall flat, and they all have to be perfectly aligned. And if they're not, it's like an equilateral triangle. If one of them's not the same, um, something's going to happen. Something's going to go wrong. If it's your setting, well, then you can play in any world. If it's your players, well. I don't know, get new players or teach them. <laughs> it's okay to teach. It, it's totally fine to coach and to, and to show the way if you if this is the vibe you're going for. And that's the importance of a session zero. Mm -hmm. So in A Hero's Journey, a journal for 5e TTRPGs published by 225, we have a session zero section that goes by like, okay, what are your expectations of this? What is this? What is, so we're all on the same page. So that yeah, we're all going to be telling stories. Or I'm not here to just kill goblins. I'm here to tell a story and you're going to lead the story and I'm just a player in it and we're here to do this together cooperatively. Um, and if your NPCs are flat, well, okay, you've got this cool world, but why, are, why is the population of the world so lame? Don't make it lame. Make it dynamic. Make it cool. Make it unique. Flavor it with the yeah. certain flavors that it needs to be flavored with. Yeah, it, it kind of makes me realize that the hardest thing, because we as DMs, obviously, we have well, it feels like we have more control uh, over the theme, the setting, uh, the plot to some extent, right? Uh, yeah. But the thing that's most out of our control is the players. And so kind of kind of launching off of uh, how you were saying that we need balance for each of those. Uh, yeah, one challenge I've always had is whenever there's a player who feels like they and how they play their character are static, because technically, they can play however they want. This is just a fun game. But you also are like, oh, they'd have more fun if they were more dynamic in how they played, you know? Their character can go from bad to good or good to bad, or, oh, they can have a bad streak and they can lose something important, but then they can also get something important later on. Yeah, and they know. absolutely how do you, how, should how do, you do that. encourage that, you know? Um, so I think if anybody's playing D&D, Nine out of ten people playing D and D have heard of a hero's journey. Not not the journal, not the not the two twenty five journal, but like the Joseph Campbell circle of like 
yeah, the, yeah. the ordinary world going on a journey. Um, and I personally, what I do is I sit there with the backstories and stuff and I go, okay, how is this going to happen? Because DMing is also, uh, here's, for all the players who have never DMed before, here's a little spoiler alert. Here's, here's the secret. Um, it's the illusion of choice, always. Whether you go to the tavern or you go to the bookstore, that NPC is going to be either in one place or the other, <laughs> and they're going to have something for you to do. So it's not one way or the other. Now, you can play it one way or the other. Like, oh, if only they'd gone to that tavern. That's not how I do it, because I, I have a structure. So on that circle, I go, okay, here is, like, uh, the the Red Hair Inn is in the Story Ellis campaign, and he's playing Tyg, who is this this furbolg bard. I say, here's his, here's his ordinary world. What journey is he going to go on that makes it that he comes back to the ordinary world at the end with, with the elixir, coming back as a different person, evolved? And it's all about the character journey. And if the character journey happens in your dynamic world, that's a story worth telling 100% of the time, every time. And if you do that for each of your characters, and you do that for yourself as like the plot, because... I mean, you have your plot, and then you have your subplots, which would be like your character development. Somebody's long-lost grandfather comes back, and they say, oh, it's been so long, and then, oh, whoa. Now they feel like you read their stuff, and they feel value as a player, and now they're more invested. And if they're invested in their acting now and their role-playing, everybody else is going to feed off that energy. So, it, again, the way that the table works now, kind of from a meta perspective, if we're looking at the table itself and not so much at the game, um, everybody's feeding off each other's like role-playing energy and that excitement and that that gumption and everybody's going to buy more into it, hopefully, um, if that's what your players want. And that should be established in session zero. So I'm going to assume that everybody does that. And I'm going to assume that that's the way it's going to go because it should have been discussed beforehand if that was going to be an issue. Excellent. Um, well, I hate to cut all of us off, but, uh, we have gone the, the, the allotted 30 minutes, which is insane to think because that went so fast. Uh, Garrett, it was awesome having you here and talking. That did. That flew by. <laughs> Honestly, I had two challenges. One, just sitting back and listening and just enjoying it. The other challenge was not like asking all the questions and things like that. So, uh, listener, if you want Garrett to come back, which I'm sure you do, you're going to have to reach out to him on his uh, his social medias, which you'll tell us in a second, and just thank him for coming on the show. You'll also have to reach out to us and thank us for having him on the show. And we'll get him back, and, and we'll we'll do another one of these. But, Garrett, how can our audience reach out to you, support you, and see what you're up to? Yeah, I mean, first off, thanks for having me on the show. This is awesome. Um, I, I, th- I mean, I'm super passionate about storytelling and about this stuff, so it's super cool to have like a, to be able to have this discussion uh, with others who really enjoy the topic. Um, but you can find uh, 225 at TWO25GAMES, G-A-M-E-S, except for on Twitch, where games is spelt with two S's, because I'm a dumb dumb and have to wait six months to get that one S. So uh, that would be 225 games. And that's where we do our podcast, The Investigation Check. That's where we do homebrewing history, where we look at historical events and homebrew those uh, characters and events. Um, that's where we do World Building Wednesdays. Uh, and, and that's just where we, we house all our programs and all our shows and stuff. So I hope you come give us a follow. Um, I hope you follow us on Instagram, where we post all our, our pictures and all our kind of what's going on in the world of 225. And um, again, to you both, Tanner and Justin, thank you all so much for having me on. Um, It was an honor and a privilege, and um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And thank you again. Yeah, likewise. No, honestly, so great to have you. Yeah. Uh, So for Tanner, Garrett, uh, before we say so long to our our adventurer listener, uh, last words from both of you. Uh, I'll go, go, because Garrett, I think, uh, would probably give a better final thought. (laughs) Um, (laughs) No, but... Honestly, for dynamic uh, d- dynamic campaigns, it's so mu- It's not about variety, because otherwise you'll just have a billion tabs open for every game, right? Uh, and I think I've realized that uh, today. It's much more about okay, can you make it so that there are there's enough there's variety that matters? Uh, can you make it so that they have highs and lows, uh, so that they're invested? in the various aspects of your campaign um, instead of just one uh, or two, you know? Uh, And I think that that's what really matters. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more to that. And I would say um, there's no right way to DM and there's really no wrong way to DM. It's whatever brings you joy, whatever brings the table joy. And 
as long as everybody's having fun, you're doing it right. Because at the end of the day, it's it's a game. Um, even though it kind of feels like storytelling guidelines more so than a game, in my humble opinion. Um, but it, it's meant to be fun. And as long as you're having fun, that's all that matters. Um, you can take everything I said as as gospel and strip, scripture. Um, you can take everything I say and throw it in the trash. As long as you are having fun, then you're doing it right. Good job. You have my my support. Good for you. You did it. Bravo. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so, listener, adventurer, make sure you have fun. Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. Uh, but from all of us here at How to Be a Better DM and from Garrett, we'll see you guys, and uh, let's go ahead and roll initiative. Thank you for listening to today's show. Uh, we really appreciate your support and your patronage. We have a few more announcements to go over. Uh, first, did you ever fall in love with the library as a kid? It was a place where you could experience a thousand stories without having to buy a thousand books. That is what Monsters at Rent can do for your D&D campaign. You can rent and swap out as many quality miniature monsters and creatures for your D&D party as you could ever want without having to buy them. You can rescue villagers from a kobold camp, or lead your party through the fighting forest, or many more adventures. We're coming out with new bundles all the time. Just sign up for our subscription to get access to your own personal library of minis. Go to monsters.rent to find out more. That's the website, monsters, with an S, dot rent. Get your library pass to a world of minis today. We also wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Stardust and Dragons. I'm going to let one of the cast of Stardust and Dragons, Christian Hatcher, and his crew tell you a little bit more about it. This August, a new adventure podcast is coming to a platform near you, filled with action. You one of the two of them. We can't hey. keep taking hits like that. Drama. Everything that she's been doing, everything she's going to do finally sets in. And Stardust. Help! Help! (coughs) Someone! Please! Find out more about this epic odyssey at stardustanddragons.com where adventure awaits in the stars. That's all the announcements we have today. Again, thank you so much for everything you do for us. You make this show possible. Like we said before, we'll be back next week with another great episode and until then... Let's go ahead and roll initiative.